Hi everybody, I'm Professor Marnie Hughes-Warrington. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic at the Australian National University. Um, here beside me is Professor Adrian Walter, who's the head of the School of Music. And what we're here to do today is to outline some significant changes to the Bachelor of Music at ANU from 2013. The changes are very exciting, educationally, and they've been quite a while in the making. For at least three years, the School of Music have been exploring new options for the delivery of music education at tertiary level, which strengthen the focus on student destinations, graduate outcomes across a range of career options. The school have been working very actively on that for three years in consultation with Adrian. We've had to accelerate the considerations in the formulation of that new curriculum model because of financial pressures. And these are financial pressures that are not just specific to the School of Music at ANU, but reflect some pressures across the sector. It was acknowledged last year in the Lomax Smith Review of Base Funding for Universities that music is one of six disciplines which the costs of teaching are not met by the funding. That's a very difficult situation and a very complex situation for music schools across the country. The very pleasing thing about this story is that this school, for quite a while now, has wanted to break out of what has become an ever-increasing cycle of reviews that have taken place across music schools in Australia. It wants to be able to provide music education firmly in the future and has done so by actively working on its curriculum. So curriculum is the big story here today, the change in education and focus on student outcomes. They begin from next year and I make it quite clear that transition students who are already in music programs at ANU that those students' needs will be met. The changes are significant. There will be a reduction in the number of staffing. The staffing must align with the curriculum model if we are to support the graduate destinations that we see as important for students in the 21st century. Those experiences are things that students have already shown interest in over the last three years. Again, this is an acceleration of tendencies and trends that we've been seeing in the school. Now, I don't know, Adrian, if you'd like to add more at this point. Thank you, Mark. Uh, that may give you a sense of the challenging environment uh, that we're having to operate in at the moment. And it's not unique to ANU. It's something that is challenging across the sector, uh, as, as Marley pointed out. How people are dealing with that is very different. A lot of institutions are taking an existing program and pruning and pruning until eventually it becomes a non-sustainable program which causes a lot of angst. Uh, we were in a fortunate position in a way that we've done a lot of work on new innovative learning technologies, new modes of delivery over the last three years uh, in partnerships with major international organisations, use of uh, high level artist level video conferencing. Uh, we've been doing a lot of new things, so we had the basic ingredients ready to go in a way to form a very exciting new sort of Bachelor of Music programme. Uh, and as Marley said, this was accelerated by the funding issue, which was actually brought ahead with the review of base funding last year. And it gets very clearly the cost of delivery is far ahead of the cost of funding. And I think all of us in the music sector were getting uh, quite uh, tired of going through the cycle time and time again, uh, where we didn't seem to have a way out. And I think uh, what we've done now, we, I think taking a very bold step, and it's uh, new in the sector, and come up with an entirely new type of program that we believe has got incredible depth of educational credibility, but also is sustainable within the current budget environment. And it puts us in the driver's seat. We are now in control of our futures. Uh, as all new initiatives, particularly when they happen so rapidly, it's going to be a difficult period because there's uh, a lot of different opinions about what the future of music education at the tertiary level in this country should be. Uh, we also have a very, very important role in engaging with our community, and that's something we're very excited about continuing. In actual fact, the new model probably enhances our capacity to engage uh, with our communities, which I believe is a very, very important role of a school of music wherever it's located, and that's been my experience. I'd just like to maybe highlight a couple of points for you that are particularly significant in the new model. Uh, one is the use of artist-level video conferencing facility. Uh, we're the only uh, tertiary institution in Australia at the moment that has this. We developed it in a park with the Manhattan School of Music in New York. What that does enables us to offer students access to world-leading experts in high-definition audio and video, mostly audio, uh, video conferencing is just video. This has high-quality audio content as well. 
I experienced a masterclass the other day with a principal percussion player from the Manhattan School of Music delivering a class into, uh, for our percussion students. After a while, the technology became transparent. You actually forgot that that person was actually thousands of kilometres away in New York at a completely different time of day. Uh, and it was a really powerful learning experience for the student. Another exciting new initiative is working what is called authentic learning, work integrated learning, where our students partner with major uh, organisations outside the university to deliver uh, sort of uh, concerts, festivals. For example, we have a very exciting partnership with the Cambridge National Music Festival, where our students immerse themselves in the festival over a 10 day period, and that's embedded in their courses. And we articulate very clear learning outcomes, and the students have an amazing experience over 10 days. So there'll be a lot more of that embedded in our programme, and the new structure enables us to do that. Uh, another one I'd like to mention to you is the way we're going to teach theory and oral in the future. Now that might be a, a tedious subject for those who don't know. Uh, it's like your grammar and your ABC, basically. But how are we going to do that? We're going to teach it in the context of composition. All students at ANU School of Music will study composition, and that's how they'll learn their grammar of music, how they'll learn their theory, their oral skills. They'll also learn improvisation. So every classical player will learn to improvise in jazz style. So when we graduate these students, they'll have a broad range of skills. The other exciting development is building on the work of the last three years. We're accommodating a whole range of professional outcomes. Uh, we're still going to support students who see performance as their professional outcome. But also there's a range of other really fabulous professions music students get involved with in teaching, in arts management, in arts policy development, in arts journalism, a whole range of areas that now we're going to support the students in developing. So that when they graduate, they'll be able to choose a pathway through the degree that actually enables them to get gainful employment at the end. It's a very tough otherwise for someone who's just trained in performance to walk out there and find a job. Those jobs as isolated activities do not exist. It's what the Bologna method now refers to uh, as a portfolio career. A student has to manage a whole range of activities to earn their income. So all of these aspects are deeply embedded in our new programme. Uh, they're cutting edge, they're very new. Uh, so that's going to create a lot of debate in the sector. But I know it's going to create a lot of interest in the sector as well. Uh, how one of Australia's leading universities is managing this problem in a very proactive way, which is, I believe, what we should be doing. So we're happy to open it up to questions now. How many full-time positions have we lost in the School of Music because of this research? Uh, well, we've been, basically, how we, well, I'll give you a number in a second, but how have we been working it out? I mean, we're looking at the curriculum. We need a certain number of academic staff to deliver that curriculum, which is about 13 academic staff, give or take, uh, to deliver the curriculum, and we currently have about 10 more than that. So in the remodel, there will be about 10 positions less than we've got now. Professor Bolton, why, why is your job not on the line here when the rest of your staff... Is, I, guess. I might answer this on behalf of Adrian that sure. Adrian's played a significant role in the past three years in guiding the curriculum changes that are underway and the acceleration of these and we would expect that he would continue to demonstrate the leadership role that he has in the past three years. So with the, the, um, the positions, you said that you're going to have to make them completely vacant and then uh, re-employ. Why, why do you do this? Why do you just not you know, take who's already there? Sure. Well, the, it, of course, will be the first option to fill the positions will be from current staff. It won't be able to, uh, advertised openly. Uh, there's a different skill set required it, with, to deliver the new, uh, the new curriculum. There will be high-level specialist skills still required. So that will, which may well be, there's quite a pool of high-level performers still on staff. But they'll also have to deliver across a range of areas. That doesn't mean they have to teach music theory or harmony, but more they have to facilitate educational content. They have to work with us in uh, helping roll out some of these new initiatives, engaging in uh, the new technology for online delivery. So we're looking for people to identify a suite of areas they feel they can contribute to, but they'll be very different positions to the ones that currently I I exist. And we felt that was uh, fair on two levels. One enabled us to start the curriculum we the way we needed to, to make sure our incoming students next year get an excellent education, but it also gave staff a time to reflect on the skill sets they do have. And we have some amazingly talented staff that already work across a broad range of areas that I'm sure are going to make an extraordinary contribution uh, to this new model. Can I also say that it's industrially appropriate for us to do that? And when will these positions fall open? 
Uh, we're probably looking, uh, well, the consul, we've got a consultation period of, uh, of, of three weeks now, uh, and I've already met with all the staff and all the students, and, uh, and already some, uh, some interesting feedback is being received, uh, and we need to continue to receive that over the next three weeks. Uh, I think that's vital, because uh, there's a huge resource there of expertise and capacity to think laterally. So we're, we put a model up for critique. We want feedback on it. Uh, and staff were really waiting for a model because I've been discussing with them before ideas. It's very hard to give ideas when there's nothing to critique. Now they've got the model. After the consultation period, uh, depending on the amount of feedback we get, there'll be a period of time where we'll need to digest that and maybe meet with other stakeholders and engage in some discussion. Uh, but then I would say we'd probably be opening up the positions uh, in the next uh, maybe two couple of months would be what we'd hope because we really want, we've got to move ahead on this because we have a cohort of students coming in next year where we need to have our staff and cohort organised. What are the financial savings you're looking at making over the next three years because of the staff redundancies? Uh, can I say that at the moment that the school is carrying an annual deficit of approximately $2.7 million. I'd also like to stress that the university is continuing its support and subsidy for the school um, and that what we're trying to do is obviously to navigate the school to a financially more sustainable position. So do you have a rough figure about what the $2.7 million deficit will look like in three years? Will it continue to be about that mark? Will any savings go back to the school of music or will they be redistributed to the cast? What we're trying to do is, to put it bluntly, to get the school to live within its means. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I think there's already been a lot of discussion about that, about the opportunity to reinvest in the school. And I think that's really one of the exciting things about that. This model, it will put us in position a few years down the track to be able to invest in a whole lot of new initiatives that we, we just currently can't do. And we're aware that's an ongoing frustration, that there are some things that we're unable to do because of the base funding. Whereas if we're able to put the school on a more financially sustainable footing, then there are some things that we might be able to do that we currently can't do. Has the university lobbied the government for an increase in base funding? Yes, we have indeed, and in fact the Deputy Vice-Chancellors from a range of institutions have been talking with the government for quite a while, not just about music, but the other disciplines that have been identified as being underfunded. Um, and of course we would encourage people to um, raise awareness of that issue as well. Um, to date, unfortunately, we've had no resolution to the issue. After the meeting with students, many said that they were considering leaving the school because of these changes. Are you expecting an exodus of students? Of current students? What we've done for current students is we've of course made available, as, we're, as we are happily obliged to do, to sit down one to one with each of them to work through the impact of the proposed changes with them and I would hate to say what the outcome of that would be because we would like students to make sure they get advice on that one to one level to work through what the implications would be for them. On that though, I guess you said that you've been working towards this for, I guess for the last three years. Um, but there are, it seems to be quite a lot of angry students and upset students. I mean, have you just not, have you mismanaged this in some way that you just, you haven't consulted properly? Um, do you take some of the, the fault for the surprise, I guess, that this seems to have been to most of the students in the school? There have been curriculum changes underway for a while. The cohort we were addressing this morning, there were at least two program changes represented in their curriculum moves all the time. And we offer new courses and take new courses away. So. We, curriculum is a dynamic thing. Um, students have expressed some concern about some particular transitions in the past and I've undertaken to discuss that with the Dean of CAS. Do you think the students have any cause for concern at all with these curriculum changes? The, one of the important things to note is that the students at the time of the meeting hadn't seen the consultation document. They now have that document. We would hope they will take that away and read it and take up the opportunity, in fact we will invite them to meet one to one with our advisors to work through what the implications are for them. So what we would ask is that we of course give students the time to digest the changes that are being proposed and that we allow them to get the advice that's appropriate for those individuals. How long could the ANU continue to subsidise the School of Music if there weren't financial changes and efficiencies? How could it, sorry? How long could it continue to subsidise the School of Music? We have no choice but to do what we need to do. How many students are currently in the uh, we have about 260 bodies. Uh, we have yeah, uh, around that number across the jazz and the classical area. How many staff all, all up? Uh, we have currently in the academic staff, we have about uh, 23. And general staff? Uh, eight, no, nine, actually. You, you put a very optimistic uh, uh, face on this, uh, uh, but of course we all read page two of the media release, and that's where um, there are some very disturbing aspects, not the least, uh, not least related to staffing. But the elephant in the room is that um, music studies 
I admit, traditionally, have not been necessarily community friendly and all of those other things that are mentioned here, but they have been elite and very highly specialised. And one of the things that worries me most of all, and must worry you, is the standard of professional training for musicians. Uh, is the School of Music in any way going to be offer, able to offer anything to outstanding young prospective musicians? Indeed, I mean, the, uh, uh, you're absolutely right in terms of our concern about the ability to train top quality professionals. Of course, we're very committed to that. Uh, what, what I suppose we've been questioning over the last few years, are we doing it in the, in the best way or are we focusing too narrowly? Uh, there will be an enormous opportunity for talented young musicians still to get a high quality education at the School of Music. Uh, it, they'll actually have richer opportunities. And one of the interesting things about this whole model that, that I was explaining to our current cohort at the moment, as well as getting their current programme delivered, which is guaranteed for them, they will also have access to a whole range of new opportunities that currently they don't have. Now, uh, I suppose, look, if, if we look at it this way, we've got two, uh, two opportunities for students. They can go to one institution and get a, a weekly individual lesson for a semester, and that's what they get, which is ever getting shorter, some down to half an hour, some down to eight weeks a semester. They can come to their new school of music, they can still have some individual lessons, but what we do, we, we, we're packaging in a very different way. We're saying to the students each semester, we'll give you a professional development allowance to use as you see fit. Now, if they're interested in pursuing uh, a high-level performance, they can use that P professional development allowance to fund some specialist high-level tuition. But if they're not going down that path, they may want to access a music business seminar being run in Melbourne or, or some other professional activity that's going to enhance their career prospects. But on top of that, they get their, so if we get the, uh, the new elite students coming in, they still get their one-on-one -on -one lessons. Uh, we'll probably fund somewhere between six, seven lessons a semester. But on top of that, they get a weekly two-hour class that will do, deal with all sorts of areas of performance. For example, there'll be what we refer to in university parlance as tutorials, where all the oboists work together, all the flautists work together in specialist technique classes, exploring issues of technique relating to those instruments. And they'll be periodically throughout the semester. Uh, they'll also engage with top practitioners internationally uh, to get some uh, in, in, uh, input into their content. And also, within the new structure, we'll be running a whole lot of these sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, learning events, as we're called in, but these professional projects where the students get to engage in those. So they get an incredibly broad, I, think, I would call a rich tapestry of opportunity uh, that is far broader and greater than what they get at the moment. But it is different. So a student will have to make that decision. If they think, I want one-on-one -on -one lessons, 13 or 14, however long the semester is, every week for that period of time, uh, that won't be, the course won't be for them. But if they say, okay, look, I, I like the idea. I, I think six, seven lessons are great, and I've got access to the lectures at the New York Phil. I've also got a link through into, into London the same way. I can do a whole range of other activities that are going to enrich my education. Uh, and that's the sort of cohort of students we're going to appeal to. And I've talked about this sort of programme now for three years. Uh, at, conceptually, uh, when I've gone out to Korea, meetings. And everybody gets very excited about it. They say, gee, this is, this is be a wonderful opportunity for our students. Because you know, if you look at the, the demographic of music students, you get the, the cream, the incredibly talented students that are going to go on and play in orchestras, potentially solo careers. Very, very few percent, probably far less than 10% will reach that. And then you get the next cohort are going to be our teachers, uh, they're going to be uh, our sort of uh, music journalists, a whole range of areas. Uh, and those students, while wanting to do performance as part of their degrees, practice based activity, they see things more, more broadly. And I know there's a large cohort of students out there uh, that would, uh, I think, be very excited by what we're going to offer them. However, someone just wants one to one tuition by themselves, and that's the focus. We probably won't excite them, but I think we're going to find a huge cohort at will. But these changes, will they affect the students who are currently studying? Students who are currently enrolled in their programs are transitioned out, and that's in line with federal arrangements. The bonus being, they'll have access to all these new things as well. So they'll get what they've enrolled to do, and they'll get their one-to-one -one tuition that's been guaranteed. You know, uh, and that's something that, that was actually never an argument with the university. They straight away said, yes, we're, we're obliged, not only by legislation, but we believe morally as well to give these students what they thought they were involved. How for. much one-to-one -one tuition is currently the standard for students? 
You mean at ANU or across the sector? Across, no, at School of Music. Well, we, we, we are well above the sector. We offer our lessons every week for 13 weeks. So 13 hours? Yeah. And what's the sector average? Uh, that now has dropped back as low as seven or eight hours up to uh, that at the most. And you'll say that it'll go to six to seven, but you get all these other enrichment yes, opportunities. Exactly, exactly. How much is the professional development allowance? What we did was we, we had a look, you know, UNSW has a professional development allowance for its, its students and what we did was we've actually proposed a rate that's higher than the UNSW rate. Can you give us a dollar figure? It's around $600. Around $600. A semester. A semester. And how much tuition would that buy, the market rates? And the market rate, that would, that would purchase any between six and eight lessons, you know, depending on, on the, on the, on the what, because there's no regulation in the private sector. People can charge what they want to charge. One of the general uh, themes coming out of the student information meeting this morning was that ANU's School of Music excellent reputation comes from the uh, international calibre of teachers that you have. By reducing 13 uh, positions that you have at the moment, one student expressed a concern that it will turn the ANU School of Music into a glorified musical tape. Do you accept that criticism? Well, I, no, I, I, I don't criticise tape. I think it's a, 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 a one of the students. Uh, I worked in a dual sector university. You know, the interesting thing about when you talk about higher ed and tape, uh, TAFE, of course, is based on competency-based training. Uh, and a lot of what we do in music training is competency-based. So in many of us, any higher education music programme in, in, in embeds a, a, a TAFE paradigm anyway. So that's an interesting question from that perspective. Uh, uh, no, I wouldn't accept the implication uh, of that comment. I think the way you build a reputation is not through specific people. Uh, they will attract a cohort of students. You may have a wonderful lecturer that may attract two or three students a year. I agree with that, and there's some wonderful teacher on staff. I think it's more than that. It's the broader quality of the programme, your partnerships, opportunities it presents for students. Uh, and I think, I know there were a lot of students excited about the opportunity of when we plan uh, study centres in New York and London and Melbourne, to be able to in, 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 engage with those. That's how you build your, your, your reputation. Uh, for example, the quality of the residents we have as they come through and deliver into our programmes. Uh, World-leading expert in residence for a few months working with our students. We had the most magnificent Baroque violinist last year, Libby Wolfish, world leader in her field, worked with our students intensely for two weeks, producing a concert at the end. And the students learnt, and admitted to me more than that, they'd probably learnt on that topic in their entire lives. So it's a very different way of doing business. Uh, just, I, sorry, sorry, can I just stress that TAFE, yes, it focuses on competency-based standards. We are actually obliged by federal threshold standards to demonstrate that students that get the chance to develop higher-order capabilities. Okay. I, th I think in, in context that question or that comment was based around the fact that you're focusing more, for, uh, sorry, away from the performance side and more on the journalistic side of the education, the policy that you've all talked about there so far. And with the um, concept that you're talking about with Louis, that was that was designed to attract key performance players, whereas now you're trying to broaden the music school to include uh, journalism and mm -hmm. policy. Sure. Do you think we'll still be able to attract those high-level people? Look, I do. I, I think we that wasn't specifically designed for high-level people. It was designed for people that wanted to learn that skill set. Uh, yes, I, I think that you know it, every music school, and I think we all agree on this, actually, what is music about? Music is about the creative act of music. It's whether you're a composer or you sit up and you, you play, you perform, whatever context. And then there's all the other things you do, you know, which is the studying of music. Uh, but, uh, and there was a comment, obviously, this morning that we might be moving down that path. Most assuredly not. We absolutely affirm the role of practice-based activity, with, uh, creative activity, within a music degree. But at this morning's meeting, you said that you... I uh, wouldn't be surprised if you attracted a lower calibre of performance uh, students to, Australia, uh, to the ANU. Uh, that, that, that's a slight misinterpretation. I know the, the students were saying that. Uh, I was saying that we'd attract a different sort of student. Uh, high calibre. Uh, we, basically, the ANU School of Music, are like we, over the years, we've taken a little thin layer of cream off the top, uh, which has been wonderful. But there's a very, very rich group of students below that that are also incredibly high achievers, highly accomplished players, study music all through their school careers, uh, that also would love the opportunity to inc include music studies uh, within their degrees. Those students will often go on and do programmes that other uh, 
other universities around Australia, maybe not a GO8 university, not a major conservator, but they'll look for opportunities, whether it's you know, something like the University of New South Wales or whatever. Now we'll be able to actually support those students, and some of them are absolutely stars, but they don't want to work at that level. Can I also point out too that sometimes, through no fault of their own, students don't get exposure to music education in primary and secondary school. And that means that they haven't had the experiences that other students have. And we would hate to see students of talent denied the opportunity to come to university and study music. The other group of students we're interested in, of course, are ANU's got a very large number of combined degree students who study two degrees at one time. There's a lot of students who would love to be able to do that. And we see that opening that up and making it more flexible for students, as well as recognising again that point of mm. have students had the chance to do these things, should they be given the opportunity? Yes, they should be. Does this mean you'll be opening more places up or are you just replacing the top level, top cream with the no. broader... Yes, we, 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 <laughs> oh, I'm flattered with it. Uh, so no musical ability whatsoever. No, oh, no, 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 no way. Uh, uh, look, we, yes, we, we will, I'm sure, have a lot more students. Yeah, that was a really important point that Marnie made in terms of the capacity for people from regional areas, either low SES areas, or people who have not been in the privileged position to have a good music education. I did a presentation uh, for a group of the heads of the regional conservatoriums not long ago, and one of the things they were so excited about this program was the fact uh, that there was a possibility within the new offerings we were developing, and we have been for three years, for their students to articulate into a music degree. Just because they haven't had the uh, top expert teaching them, we'll accommodate that. But I've always looked at it like if you take someone into a law degree, you expect them to be competent in a range of issues, literacy, numeracy. You don't expect them to understand torts at that point. Uh, that's what we're there to teach them. So we want people who've got musical ability, they're well educated, they've done well in their school system, with, uh, and we'll embrace those students, absolutely. How many more students do you want to take and how are you going to change your selection criteria to not get that very small percentage of the cream of the crop? Mm -hmm. Well, if you, as an example, we actually already, last <coughs> year, we had something like well, well over 500 applicants for the school. Uh, and we admitted in the end less than 100. Uh, so I think there is the interest already there. And a lot of those students were excellent. They just weren't at that very, very elite level. And the admission standards are standards that the school proposes to the college. The college then considers those, approves them on the basis of federal thresholds about what a bachelor degree is, and that's also then approved at university so level as well. So how that change to broaden it out? How are you going to... Do you want to explain? Well, it's, how we uh, select students is usually for an audition process and an interview. Uh, we're, we're both are very important to us. An interview to get a sense of the career path the students are aspiring to in, in, with their Bachelor of Music, and the audition to see their level of competency. Uh, now, obviously, we still require a level of competency from, uh, in, in the performance area from a student, but it gives us an idea to assess that and say, OK, well, and what programme would they be best suited to? Uh, whereas up until now, we've basically auditioned students for one thin stream. Uh, and that's been at the very, very high level of performance. Now we're going to be auditioning this range of students and we'll say, OK, well, we, we can recommend a lovely option for you within our new programme. If you had less than 100 new uh, positions last year, how many do you think you will open up next year? Uh, it's hard to say. I would, I, I would think that, that we've, we've got to significantly increase that. I, I, I mean, the, if you consider there was, uh, in, in the total... Uh, Last year, in first preferences for the for the school of music, there was something like uh, uh, 140. So that they were people that had made a decision. I want to come and study music at the ANU School of Music. So I, I would suggest we'd increase uh, by a significant percentage the number of students. Can you give us any idea? Well, it's a demand-driven sector, as you know. Yes, and if you've had 500 applica applications, you could basically say, well, perhaps we might expect to enrol 200 students next year. Do you have? A rough idea. Look, I, I think double, double your intake. Uh, I, I look. I, I would be reticent to start sort of putting those numbers on the table. Uh, what I'm saying is that that we're going to increase our cohort significantly because we're giving a greater range of students the opportunity. But at the same time, as I said, we do have agreed standards for admission for the university, so there's no question that we're going to, you know, just open the doors and let everybody in. But having said that, people who love music, they want to apply here. We would love to hear from them. This is obviously being announced in the context of uh, Professor Young's budget cuts, which were then uh, 
possibly taken back. It's not entirely, well, no one seems to be entirely certain uh, what's still on the table and what isn't. Is this part of the budget cutting process in the university as a whole, or is this a separate issue? This is a separate issue. As I said before, this has been three years in the making, and it's been accelerated by the particular financial circumstances that the school was in. So if the 2.7 million were found in the, um, the school stock running deficit, would that be counted as part of the overall budget cuts? No, this is, again, this is just yeah. asking the music school to live within its okay. means. Yeah. Thank you.